The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, this short, sharp session on the GROW model, the GROW coaching model. So welcome wherever you are. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm being heard. So just over in the question box, if you wouldn't mind, just type in the word clear. That just lets me know that um, you can hear me, which is always a good thing. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, John. Thanks, Conrad. Thanks, Sharon. Great. Okay. Looks like we're coming through loud and clear, which is wonderful. So the GROW model, of course, was designed by um, John Whitmore, who put this together as a coaching model. It's a really powerful model, and I'm sure you're familiar at least with it, but I want to run through it with you today and talk about how you might use it effectively in your own particular uh, leadership and coaching processes. So pretty much we've got 30 minutes together and I just wanted to do three things in this 30 minutes. I wanted to introduce you to GROW and I suspect that some of you would be aware of GROW, but um, I just want to introduce it to you anyway and talk a little bit about how it works and perhaps talk about my own experiences with it and uh, consider how it might uh, impact on leadership. And then perhaps even talk about why it works towards the end. So at the end of the presentation, you'll get a copy of the slides, you'll get a copy of the recording. So if because you're registered, I'll just simply send you out an email, perhaps this afternoon. But if you've got any questions specifically about today and you want to ask them, then just type them in the question box there and I will deal with them as they come up. I won't be leaving 10 minutes towards the end for questions because there's always that awkward pause at the end. So as soon as you've got a question, as soon as you've got something you'd like to ask or even a comment, please do so in the question box and I'll respond to it as soon as possible. All right, so let's get underway and let's talk about GROW and um, let's just do a quick overview of what GROW is all about. And uh, but, but just before I go into that, I do want to make the point that there are two really important underlying assumptions around using GROW as a model. And I find that some leaders do have difficulty using it because they perhaps don't buy into these two assumptions. So it's very important that if you're looking at introducing this or you're thinking of using it or perhaps you have tried to use it in the past and it hasn't worked, it could be based on the assumptions. And these are the two assumptions. And the first key assumption is that leaders are in the business of asking questions, not answering questions. And so obviously the GROW model is all around a series of questions. Now, but of course, most people in a leadership role are, are, are technically trained. They're very, very effective at what they do. They've actually been, they've done a, you know, they've done a, a some sort of a course or a, an apprenticeship or a university degree, whatever it might be. But any of that education is about teaching people to answer questions, not to ask questions. So when you get an assumption like this, that leaders are in the business of asking questions, it becomes quite difficult <clears throat> for the expert to be able to start asking questions instead of answering them. Now, this is particularly the case because in many cases, you know the answers. So when you're coaching someone using GROW, you actually know the answers. So it's even more difficult for you not to actually give people the answers, even though you might know those answers. So that's one key assumption, that this whole process of coaching is pretty much based on a series of questions that guide and inform the person to come to their own resolution. Now, the other assumption that's important is, and then again, it's another stumbling block for a lot of managers, and that is that the job of a leader is to help people to help themselves, but not necessarily to help them. Now, there is obviously a difference there. So this whole coaching model is actually to be able to help people catch a fish rather than catch the fish for them, as the old adage goes. So the key thing here is that leader must really 
must realise that they're not in the business of spoon feeding people. They're in the business of giving them some capability so that they can answer their own questions. So you can understand perhaps why those two assumptions might prevent people from embracing GROW because obviously uh, if you believe you're supposed to be the expert and you're the person who answers questions and you believe you're the person who's supposed to be helping your people, spoon feeding them if you like, then it's likely that you're probably not going to find GROW as useful as it would be for other people. So I just want to share that with you before we got underway. I'm sure there are other assumptions there as well, but I think they're the two key ones that I have found from my own experience coaching people that often stop people using GROW to the extent that it should be used. Now, um, what you're seeing on your screen is actually a quick summary of GROW. And just to reiterate, I'm going to just give you an overview of this and then I'm going to go and talk about each of the steps along the way. The other thing that I find people get hung up about with using GROW is that they feel that they must go through a G and an R and an O and a W in that order and do it very systematically. But you can have a very good coaching session by just covering a G or an R. So if you just talked about the goals, in other words, what the person's trying to achieve and what some of the barriers are preventing them from achieving that, then that in itself can possibly be a very good coaching session. Unfinished coaching session, but a good starting point. So don't get too hung up on making sure that you ask exactly the questions that I'm suggesting and that you do it in exactly the same order. See, for example, it's possible to put the R and the G around the other way. In other words, you could talk about the barriers initially, and then you could talk about the actual, you know, the results that you want, the end result. So don't get too hung up about it. The, it's a methodology, and it's there to guide and inform you and to assist you to have a better coaching experience with your particular, uh, with the person you're coaching. But at any rate, the model set up around G standing for goal, and this is around giving people a big picture of what they're trying to achieve. Now, um, if people can't work out what the ideal result is when you're coaching them, then that's a problem, isn't it? So they should be able to articulate up front what the ideal outcome would be, assuming this goes well for them. And that's why we start with G, because that really is the key point to start with. Where are they going? What, what is the ideal outcome they're aiming to achieve? Now, once we've established that, uh, the next step, of course, is to look at any barriers that might be in the way that are either in the way now or in the way potentially in the future. So, for example, if you're coaching somebody uh, about a problem, they come to you about a problem and so the problem is the fact that there are a number of roadblocks or barriers in the way, then obviously what you do is talk about those roadblocks and barriers. But if you're delegating a project to someone and you haven't quite, you know, the person hasn't quite come anticipated what those barriers might be, they certainly haven't come up against them, you might then talk to them about what they see as the potential pitfalls or barriers along the way. But either way, by identifying these barriers, you're in a position now where you can do something about them because clearly the barriers, uh, which is the reality, the barriers are the things that are likely to get in the way. Now, barriers can be anything. You know, barriers can be organisational constraints, barriers can be self-belief, barriers can be other people, barriers can be a blockage of information, barriers can be political games being played, all sorts of things are open to that. So you have a good discussion around the barriers. So what we've really done now is the G talks about where we're going and the R is talking about what's stopping us getting to where we need to be. So when you go to the O, which is options, and you'll notice it's plural and that's important because the options really, uh, you know, often in most cases, there's more than one way of dealing with something. So really, uh, you need to explore a number of options with people. That might be the possibility because if there's only one possible option open, if that fails, then what happens then? 
So the whole purpose of this is to open up the possibilities to talk about some different ways of approaching it. So you talk about the opportunities and the possibilities. And I, I warn you, if you haven't used this before and you're an expert in your area, this is, this is the difficult part because you already know what the options are. So as the leader, you're already well and truly aware of what the best options are. But that's not the point. The point is you want the other person, that is the coachee, to consider what those options might be, to come forward with some of those ideas themselves so that they own the ideas and they own those concepts. And that's particularly important and very difficult for some people to bite their tongue at that point to allow people to come and explore those options. So you need a little bit of patience at that point. There's no doubt about that. So once we've explored several options, the next step is to actually say what next, which is one way of putting it all way forward. So this is the first tangible steps that are required in order to get the person moving towards the goal that they've articulated in the coaching session. And so what it means is that if, we're, if you're sitting down coaching someone, this is really what is the next step after leaving the coaching session. So you're basically giving people uh, an opportunity to consider what they need to do first in the process. But you don't need to go into a great detail at this point about a big plan of action, but it's more getting everything moving in the right direction. So that's how it works. So you can see it's pretty much a sound basis for moving forward. And uh, as I said, it's the most difficult part is the O because you already know exactly what the answers are but again it's not helpful for you to give people the answers because if you give people the answers then what happens is and i'm not suggesting the answers are wrong but if you give people the answers then they don't they don't own the answers and that's the problem you actually need your coachee to own the answers and that's what this is all about that's why i talked about those two assumptions underpinning grow. So let's look at some of the questions that you might ask. And of course, you don't have to ask, you know, 10 questions for each or whatever. Once you've exhausted, once you've got some clarity around that particular part of grow, then you move on to the next section. There's no point in labouring it any further if it's already been decided. So when you look at the first step, which is goal formation, there's a couple of questions for you on the right hand side. Now, you might say, oh, I can't imagine asking that. Well, you, you, you can ask whatever you like, as long as it's in the, th in the theme of that grow or the, or the goal. So for you to be satisfied with this situation, what would it look like? Uh, what, do you, what are you trying to achieve here? How will you know you've been successful? It's another good question. And what are you aiming for? So all of these questions um, allow a conversation to evolve around the end result. Because normally what happens is when people come to you with a problem, for example, they will normally launch into all the barriers. And what happens is they'll talk about other things that are not actually barriers. And, you know, we'll sit there for 45 minutes patiently listening to people and all the while we're creating this downward spiral of negativity. And of course, by that stage, um, it's pretty hard to even move towards a solution. So my, my suggestion to you is to say to people, just stop for a moment. The first thing I want to find out from you is what are you trying to achieve? All right, which turns the emphasis back on the G, which is the goal part. And that works extremely well. So if you once you've artic once the other person, the coachee's articulated, you know, what the end result is, we can then move on to a second set of questions around what's happening right now. So questions that you might use are what are the what are the key things getting in the way of you achieving this goal or outcome? What are the barriers to success? Uh, what's stopping you? And can you identify the obstacles? So all of those questions are helpful. You don't have to ask them all, of course. But the whole purpose of that is to start to get people to focus on the core barriers. 
And this is a very convenient way to stop people talking about all the other things that are around going on at the time. All you're really interested in at this stage is to work out what the key barriers are that's going to prevent the person achieving the goal that they've articulated to you just before. So, you know, work with that. Um, I find it's quite useful sometimes to say, ask questions like, apart from that barrier, are there any other barriers that might be getting in, in the way? So, in other words, we try and exhaust all those barriers because those barriers, of course, are real and that will prevent the person from achieving success. Now, once we've done all that, we can move on to the third set of questions, which is very much around options. And as I said earlier, this is the area that's probably the most difficult for a leader because they already know the options and because you know the options, there's always that temptation of sharing them, of course, with other people. But a couple of questions you might like to ask here is, what have you thought about doing to resolve this? What are your options? How can, uh, who can help you resolve this? So this is talking more around the support that might be in play. What are some of the other possibilities that perhaps you haven't considered? So be patient with step three here because this is very important to allow the person to really think about what it is that they can do to help them achieve the goal. Now they might say to you, well, that's the whole reason I'm coming to you. But you can just simply say, look, I'm not in the business, I'm, I'm in the business of helping you help yourself, and that's what I'm trying to do here. So try some of those. Once you've got one option, I don't think it's a good idea to move on. I think you could say, is there anything else that you could consider? So at least get two options at this point. And what's important here is not to do too much judging and evaluating. Your job, again, is not to judge and evaluate. Uh, because if you do that, then all of a sudden you're, you're, you, you are not doing what one of those assumptions was, was, which was pretty much helping leaders or helping people help themselves. So once we've done that, the final step in the process is pretty straightforward because we're now going to ask people what I like to say, what next? Or you could say here, way forward. So, so which of these options is the most feasible might be a good question if there are a couple of options on the table. Why have you chosen that course of action? So you're evaluating it, but more importantly, you're getting them to evaluate it. What's your next step? What support will you need from me and others? Or I just often say, how can I help? And so what we're trying to do here is just to formulate some very first baby steps that will get people up and running so that you know there's some momentum that's taken place after the coaching session, which is really important. So does anyone have any questions at this point they'd like to ask? Because now is a good opportunity to to ask. That's the mechanics of it, if you like. I don't want to spend too much time on the mechanics, but that's pretty much how it works. And I want to share with you a little bit of my own experience as I now talk about this. I want to give you some what I would call insider tips. Um, now, the insider tips mean that these are things from my own experience using Grow for many, many years that I could give you, which might be helpful for you. So, so one insider tip I'd give you is that look for opportunities to use Grow. So, you know, it's very important not just sit back and think, well, I'll wait for the coaching session to arrive because it may never arrive in the, my, in, in the thinking that you might have. So you can use this anywhere. Uh, you can use it in the corridor. You can use it in your office. You can use it on a park bench, anywhere at all. And the beauty of this is that often you won't ha have a, um, you know, any any sort of warning that there's an opportunity to use Grow. So what I'm saying is I think you should seek out opportunities to use it. And so really, I suppose the only criteria is if people have got things that they want to talk to you about that they want to run by you, which might be part of their work then I think it's probably open for a coaching session using Grow. 
The other insider tip, I another insider tip I'd say is uh, have a visual reminder. So what I suggest is that you write G R O W on your whiteboard in your office area if you've got a whiteboard, or put it somewhere where you'll see it every day. Reason being is it's a it's a reminder that I should be using this as a coaching methodology. So have it near you. No one else has to know what G R O W stands for. It's just a word. Nobody will probably know unless they know what the coaching is all about. So have it written somewhere where it's convenient and will remind you each day to use it. Also, I'd suggest to you that one of the hardest things in GROW is not to, not to give advice, as I've alluded to, but also not to judge what someone says. So what I mean by that is you've just got to allow people a free-flowing conversation where people are putting forward their ideas and their thoughts. And, pray. and you'll find often that people will talk themselves out of uh, situations. You don't need to say something like, that won't work. Or if you say something like, uh, I've tried that, but it doesn't work. You've really stifled the opportunity for the person then to contribute in the conversation. Now, another thing I'd suggest to you, and I don't think this works very well, is don't take any notes. There's no point in taking notes. I mean, it's very easy to remember G-R-O-W, so you don't have to worry about writing all that down. And every time you take notes, you are sending a signal to the other person, or at least you're prompting in their mind a question, what are they writing down? You know, So it, it destroys the fabric of the conversation. So don't take any notes, just talk, just maintain steady eye contact in a relaxed environment and just keep G-R-O-W in front of mind as you go through. And the other point I'd make, and, um, and, and it's, it's often challenging, but the point of this exercise is to be patient and allow the other person to come to their own judgments and conclusions. And that is often difficult for people who already know the answer, as I've mentioned before. So just relax, let them work it out. You'll find that using GROW will minimise your time, not increase it. The reason it'll minimise your time is that you won't be talking about a whole lot of extraneous things that needn't be discussed. And it also means that every time people come to you, if they're used to you using a GROW methodology, then they're probably likely to be a little more prepared and have some answers for you because they'll know that you'll be asking them questions around that. So that actually is a great thing for you to consider. So there's some insider tips that I think you might find very helpful in your process. Um, so the benefits really are, summing up, the benefits are, are really, one is it's very simple. I mean, anyone can remember four letters. So it's nice and simple. The benefits are that it can be used in a range of situations. Another benefit is, is it what it does is it enables others to help themselves. So it's, you're not giving them lectures and directions and all the rest. You're helping them help themselves. And that's a great benefit in my view. So it's a developmental tool. It saves time because you'll find that you could literally have a coaching session using four questions. What are you trying to achieve? What's stopping you? What are your options? And what next? You know, you could literally get through a session very quickly with four questions, but you might probably like to elaborate a bit further on that. All right, so um, that's pretty much uh, it from me. Um, does anyone have any last minute questions before I wrap up? No, not at this stage, okay. So one of the, I think there is one question there. No, not there. So one of the things I'd like to do, if I may, just as I finish up in closing with you, is I just wanted to uh, give a quick plug, if I may, to my next Lunch and Learn. My lunch and, the Lunch and Learn series, I think some of you would be aware of, but it's basically done online. It's done over lunch, around lunchtime at least. And what happens is we cover six modules. Now you can see there's six units there. Uh, in front of you. Uh, our next session is starting on the 29th of June, which isn't that far away. And 
if you're interested in attending or you've got people that you know who would be interested in attending, then just shoot me an email and we can sort all that out. Um, and if you want more information about it, by all means, I'm happy to send you some more information as well. But one of the things we do cover is the GROW model, but that's not the only thing we cover, of course. But pretty much this is a great program to give people some more leadership literacy around a whole range of different topics, as you can see in front of you, and I won't run through all that with you. So Adam, um, you want to ask a question? Go for your life. Could the GROW model be used for conflict resolution? Yeah, good question, Adam. It can be, and I've used it for uh, conflict. Now, it depends on what the conflict is. Um, if it's between two people, probably not really uh, helpful. But if someone uh, is, you know, if you're in conflict with someone or they're in conflict with someone else, you could talk to them about the goal. What's the, what's the barriers that are getting in the way? What are the options open to you know, reduce the conflict? And what has to happen next? So in that sense, it can be used. I've never used it where you've got two people who are at loggerheads with each other, I must say. But I could imagine it could be used. So in other words, you could talk about the big picture at the beginning, talk about the roadblocks around their own working relationship. What are the options open? Um, yeah, a harmonious relationship, I agree. I think it'd be very useful in those sorts of arrangements. I think so. Uh, what are the options open and what, what, are, what do we need to do next? So I think that would work quite well, actually. So yeah, absolutely. Pretty much anything's open to using Grow because it's such a great methodology. So hopefully that helps, Adam. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, you could use it in any sort of context around uh, conflict and so forth because pretty much the steps that are in there are the steps that you'd probably use anyway, wouldn't you, when you're dealing with conflict? So I think it's certainly got a lot of application that way. So thanks for that. So anyone else got questions? That's a great question. Thanks, Adam. I think you could use it for virtually anything if you put your mind to it. Um, and Adam's just saying, thanks, I like it. Sounds very simple and effective. Yeah, look, it is. It's not a theoretical thing. It works brilliantly in practice and just try it out, see what you think. And I think you'll be amazed at the incredible impact it'll have when you go through it. Um, so guys, just uh, mentioning that if you're interested in the Lunch and Learn, we've got the next one starting very soon. So the idea would be to uh, send me an email. I'll organize all the registration and all the rest of it. But I think we've had we've had some excellent feedback and 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 the great news is you're not paying for travel and uh, you know all of the things that you have to do. You just have to have a computer screen and uh, very similar to what we're doing today. And we go through and you can ask me questions. You're getting homework at the end. You get a copy of all the slides. You get a copy of all of the um, of the recordings as well. Exactly what you're doing today. And uh, yeah, we've had some great success with it. So anyway, that's the end of my plug. So folks, thank you. Thank you for your involvement. I hope you found that useful and uh, keep your eyes peeled because very soon, when I say very soon, perhaps sometime this afternoon, if not tomorrow, I'll be sending out a, a copy of the slides and the recording. And um, as I said, if you're interested in doing the lunch and learn, let me know. So thanks everyone, um, have a wonderful weekend and uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you if need be and thank you for supporting my webinars. I appreciate it and thank you and goodbye and all the best. Have a great weekend. Thank you.